So you think you're going to stay in Venice, or are you going to play around with the idea of having some? No, I'm here? staying. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wouldn't actually know where to go. Like wherever I've lived in the past, I've always felt like there's somewhere that I want to go to. Mm -hmm. I don't have that feeling anymore. You didn't shoot any editorial last season because you just sort of took it off and you might try to do the same this season. Um, not, it's not based on any kind of uh, apathy or prejudice or anything like that. I just didn't feel like I had anything to say. Yeah. And I just, I'm not, I can't get into that. I've always struggled uh, with the mindset of just shooting editorial for the sake of it. You know what I mean? To just keep putting your name out. I mean, I understand that's part of the business that we do, but... Um, I find that if you just keep putting out imagery that you don't think is strong enough, it gets demoralizing. I thought I'll just take a break for a little while and then when I've got something to say, I'll start again. And what usually triggers that? Uh, and nothing particular. I mean, it comes from anywhere. It's just when you wake up one morning and then you're suddenly excited to do something again. I feel like I'm really excited about my advertising work. I think actually the industry as a whole is getting a little more interesting right now. People are just starting to take a few more risks and stuff like that. I think what they realize is looking at a magazine where every picture looks the same is not a good idea. Yeah. So I don't know who sparked that idea. I guess Alessandro was definitely one of them, but the idea that you can actually take a company and just turn it completely upside down and try something new and it still works was a bit of an eye opener. It's like, oh, you can actually do this. Obviously, you know, you and I have had a number of conversations over the years about what evolutions are occurring in the business and what that means for photography and kind of what changes are happening there. What do you think is different about how to come up in the business effectively today than perhaps when you started? Well, fashion entered its industrial period for sure. So the, it's very different to when I started. Um, it's actually to completely unrecognizable. It's a very, very, very different industry. So I think for young people coming in, they have to come in really understanding what they're getting into and what the ramifications are and the parameters and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it's very industrial, you know. But, you know, that's kind of a natural process, to be honest. That's kind of where it is. And it's only going to increase from here. I think the next period of AI is where it's going to start getting really fascinating, not from a fashion photography point of view. I'm not quite sure what the connection of that is, but where our world is essentially entering is that whoever owns the most data has all the power. So if you look at a country like China that has a billion people to farm data from, they're the next Saudi Arabia with all the oil. You know what I'm saying? They, they're essentially going to be very beneficial from that. And so when you look at a country like England, you think, well, where do you fit into that with 70 million people? You know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. a, so uh, America is obviously uh, position to be to do very well in that but that's essentially where our, our the next step of our evolution is heading you know is into that and data farming and all that kind of stuff but yeah from our fashion photography industry it's really just producing material at a rapid speed and just getting it out yeah you know and just being able to use the latest technology to you know sell that message as quickly as possible I mean I look at my son now who's seven and his uh, attention level is so small because he's so used to, even though he'll sit down and he'll happily read a book for half an hour and stuff like that, he's never going to be able to sit down and watch a Bergman movie or a Fellini movie. He'll just find it so utterly tedious and boring, you know, what I mean? which is, I find that really tragic, but that's what he's being... Well, neurologically, they're wired differently, Yeah, right? he'll be completely wired differently, yeah. I mean, a lot of people now feel like it's easier to read articles rather than sit down and be interested in an entire book. No, everything now is a snapshot. Absolutely. Yeah, and a headline. Absolutely. And yeah. when you watch a movie, you're typically checking your phone regardless just because you need that yeah. fix of distraction. It's... Yeah, and that, that's where, you know, a lot of negative politics in this country has become so successful because they've realized the power of the snapshot. You know, they can say one headline. And people are very happy just to read that headline, take that as gospel, and then they'll move on. I love it because it's new and it's fascinating, but it will destroy us ultimately. It's like you're playing with the devil, you know what I mean? What do you mean? For that exact reason. I mean, we're going to start having wars because of social media. You know, people are going to be oppressed. They're going to be locked out of countries. They're like, 
All of that is happening because of social media, you know. I was editing this film for a fashion client the other day and the, the, the director's cut was two minutes and 15 seconds, which felt like a really nice length for that particular piece. And then I got kind of frustrated that I then had to chop it down to 60 seconds so it fits on Instagram. And then I thought to myself, who are you kidding? Like, how many people are actually going to sit through 60 seconds? You're going to have to communicate this film to people probably in 10 seconds, you know what I mean? So that's pretty demoralizing when you think on that kind of level. But I, I always believe that out of all of these massive changes, like really amazing things happen as well. Absolutely. Like there's going to be great things that come out of this. We just can't see it yet. Absolutely. So, and I'm kind of eager to see what that is. You know? Your thought on the idea of um, whether or not people are generally desensitized to imagery just because of the constant state of exposure? Or do you think it's I like do, words? Where no, I do think that. And, and I think it harps back to what I was saying about magazines where it all looked the same. I think that is the case. However, from my own personal experience, when a really good image pops up, I do stop and look at it. Or it's not even necessarily a good image, it's an image that appeals to me. Yeah. So I wonder if people have now much quicker filtering systems where they can go, no, 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 interesting, you know what I mean? No, 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 no. It's like this kind of fast, but I find that I always do stop on something and study it or screen grab it or whatever. So I just wonder if we're learning, uh, as a nation, we're learning to be good editors. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Because I, I noticed myself when I first started taking pictures, it would, I would get back 10 or 20 contact sheets and I would spend maybe a week going over them and over them questioning and did I pick the right picture? Should I crop it a little bit? And just really spending so much time, you know. And, uh, and then obviously as you get better, you don't do that anymore. You're like, that one, that one, you know, you become... Almost more well-versed in the visual language, really. Yeah, you, learn, you just learn to trust your instincts and just pick the shot and move on. So I think that's kind of where we're getting to as a, on, a, in, in, on a sort of global level, you know. We're becoming keeps, good editors. I like that. That's, mm. You always give really good, like, one-liners. Soundbite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> um, and what sort of keeps it all interesting for you? I guess the changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm still, I still get really excited by the fashion, to be honest. Yeah. That's kind of what drives me. I mean, when I walk on set and I see someone in an outfit that I haven't seen before and a look, it's really thrilling still. So I'm really glad I still have that. Absolutely. And you don't see that every day. I mean, it doesn't happen that often. And, you know, I was lucky to grow up in the 70s where in England fashion was changing so fast in such a great way to to sort of bear witness to that. And then as I got a little older to participate in it, I miss punk, unfortunately, but I, I joined in around New Romantics and onwards. Um, I'm still resentful about the fact that I miss punk, but anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, but um, yeah, it was kind of amazing to watch that. And then, you know, by the time I was 15, I just really wanted to be a part of it. So I left home and went to London and, you know, got involved, but uh, that's, still lights me up when I walk into the studio and someone puts something in front of my camera that looks amazing. It's kind of still the best feeling. So what changes are you seeing in the industry from a model agent point of view? Well, I think it started very early on when people needed a story. You know, you could no longer exclusively be the girl who opened a particular show or had a campaign or got a cover. You know, what's the other layer? Obviously, some people think that's just exclusively coming in the guise of nepotism in terms of your last name or who you're dating or whatever. But right. there are also other elements that people just are much more desperate to have and I think it's similar to what you were saying as far as what an image has to have to stick out from an ocean you know and I think that it's much more saturated than it once was and because of that you have to be more interesting and so we look at it very much in terms of individual narratives rather than perhaps what was once a series of boxes that you just checked off. People didn't necessarily want the talent to have that much power that they once did and so they were just sort of dwindled down to a particular aesthetic that felt right to whichever creative at that moment and it became so homogenized that you had no identities yeah. and I think we're very much moving into the vein where that's something that's important which has made I think the job of model management much more interesting because you're able to be more creative and I think you end up being more collaborative with the talent you're working with. So what's going to happen but like so on my the last shoot that I did I would say with 60% celebrities and 40% models. But you're a model agency, you don't represent celebrities. We have both, we've recently yeah. opened talent. Yeah. So is that the new thing, that your agency will now start representing actors, singers? 
Absolutely. Before, I think there was much more of a stigma surrounding the idea that you had fashion representation if you were a credible actor or singer or right. whatever. And that's just kind of dissipated. You yeah. know, I think the way you approach a conversation or a project or kind of curate people's projects is very different when you approach it from the perspective of like the fashion space versus exclusively PR or even just management and acting. So I think it's all kind of come together in a much more collaborative way and less segregated. Yeah, I think what has to happen, which w I think is starting to happen and will happen more and more in the next couple of years, is educating um, celebrities to how a fashion shoot works and how different it is to a movie. So just to give you a small example, um, we were doing a uh, perfume commercial with a film actress, right? Mm -hmm. and, and it was a huge production. It was like 200 people. And da -da. So it almost replicated exactly a film production. Mm -hmm. But the mechanism of which it works is completely different. So when they get there in the morning, they see large crew, they see first AD, cameraman, sound guy, da -da -da. so they feel like they're in this very familiar environment. But where film and fashion differs entirely is that on a film set, everything is locked down really tight. Mm -hmm. Like nothing can fail, you know what I mean? Because you, you've got like between say six weeks and three months or a year or whatever to complete this movie and every day counts, right? Mm -hmm. You've got this very, very strict locked in um, catalog of, of shots that have to be done every single day. They're all timed. So by two o'clock, you're out of the house. You're into the car shot, 10 past three, you're out of the car shot and you're back into the house and then you're on the roof for dusk and it's all laid out like that. On a fashion shoot, the fashion designer has the ability or the art director to walk in and go, I know we planned this, but actually now I don't like it. So we have to like rethink this through, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So you can then completely break apart the whole structure that's been put in place by the producer and that happens all the time. Of course. So what that means for the actors is that they sit around in the motorhome waiting for quite a long time Why you have to break that shot down, move the lighting, change it to another place, relight it, try it, let the creators really look at it and see. And, you know, the hair and makeup on a film are very unimportant. They're sort of, you know, 20th in line of importance, whereas on a fashion shoot, they're really important. They're like right at the top. So, you know, you're waiting for them and they have a say and, you know, they're sort of creating on set and building things. So it's a very different discipline. And so I've found I've come, under, come up to a lot of problems with actors where they just don't understand that. They see it that you're just being really unprofessional. They're, oh, like, wow. they're like, oh, but why did you have me be ready at nine? And you're not, not going to be ready until 1030. That's an hour and a half. Like, how did that happen? And so you have to kind of try and they get very frustrated by it. Absolutely, very derailed. So now what I try and do is I try and sit down with them in the morning and just explain, unfortunately, these are, it's a, what the differences are and how it can happen and try just to smooth that over. Have you found that with the arrival of uh, video being more and more prevalent, does that affect the way you cast? Do you find that certain people that were perhaps the right choice for print aren't necessarily as translatable on video or is that not an issue? Yeah, when you were with actors, and then you come to the film portion, mm -hmm. it's kind of amazing actually, like the way they, like, you know, when you're working with a bunch of uh, models that are straight out of school and never had any formal training of being in front of a camera, when you're doing a still picture, if they're the most wooden person, you can still create something, you can trick it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. you, when you come to shooting film, you can't lie. If they're wooden in front of the camera, they're just wooden. You know what I mean? <laughs> and it doesn't matter how good a director you are and how many tricks you pull and how many things, they still come across like that. And so sometimes when you've been doing that for a long time and then you'll end up on set with a famous actor or a very successful actor and they really know how to be in front of the camera, it's just like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, it's like, I don't have to explain anything. I just tell them what I need them to do and they do it, boom. And they're like supernatural. They, have the right instincts, they know never to sigh or how to keep mm. things moving and react and stuff like, you know, it's great. So there's, you know, you win and lose. But I love that you're never opposed to change. One of my favorite things that I ever heard you say was, um, what was it that we went to? The um, LA Photo? Uh -huh. And um, 
someone in the audience, of course, you know, asked you a question pertaining to a particular era that they idealized, and you said it wasn't better. People just remembered as being better because they were younger. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> People romanticize everything in the past. Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, now, I remember having this conversation with a stylist, and she was complaining about the now, and I just said, you're going to look back in 20 years' time and think of it as the most creative period in your life mm -hmm. because it's the last era of where the printed magazine has so much importance mm -hmm. and things are just going to get quicker and quicker and quicker and you're going to have to rush more at work and you're not going to be able to spend as much time. So you'll look back at this period as that great period, but right now you're just complaining about it all the time, but that's just part of being young. I mean, obviously, it's, I suppose, not really all that big of a surprise, but do you have any thoughts about that? kind of jump out of the magazine and into a digital lead? Uh, it's very natural. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't feel like the, the, like it's not possible for a com company to resist that at this point. Like, because you'll go out of business. You know what I'm saying? It's like, so, so they have to embrace it. That's where we're at. That's where the industry's at now. That's where the people that are buying fashion are at right now. So they have to move with the times. And then the core of the fashion industry is all about change. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. It's all about pursuing the new. Um, so that's what it should do. You know what I mean? That's what, where we should all go. I, I like change. So for me, it's exciting. I like seeing the new. You're in the right business. Although it sometimes yeah. changes slower than you'd like. Yeah, right? fashion can be, can really procrastinate actually. How do you feel about the very prevalent discussions surrounding diversity as they apply to anything from gender to race to body type? Obviously fashion, some people feel is a kind of aspirational industry and so as such, it focuses on what people consider ideal in terms of fitness levels or, or whatever the norm might be. What are your feelings about diversity in terms of how the general population is represented in fashion imagery? I mean, it's happening. It's just happened too slow, but at least it's getting there. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. It can. It, it needs more, but it's at least it's moving in the right direction. Definitely. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.